On July 16, 1969, the towering silhouette of the Saturn V rocket, a behemoth of American engineering, cast a long shadow on the Florida landscape. The Apollo 11 mission was poised to embark on a journey that would etch its narrative into the tapestry of human history. Astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins were about to be catapulted by this colossal 363-foot beast of steel and fuel into the unknown, setting a course for the moon. But have you ever paused to consider what these astronauts brought back with them? Objects not merely of scientific interest, but enshrouded in layers of mystery and intrigue? From moon rocks to dust samples, each artifact bore the weight of humanity's first contact with an alien landscape. Yet some of these souvenirs sparked a myriad of questions and fueled speculation to this day. As we embark on this cosmic journey, we invite you to ponder along with us. What secrets did these lunar artifacts reveal? How have they reshaped our understanding of the moon, and perhaps more fundamentally, our place in the universe? In the immortal words of Neil Armstrong, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Join us as we leap once more into the unknown, retracing the footsteps of Apollo 11 and delving into the mysteries of the moon relics that they returned with, those seemingly innocuous objects that have fascinated and puzzled us for over half a century. Welcome to the diary of Julius Caesar. Dawn of a new horizon, the US-Soviet duel for the stars. In the tense atmosphere of the mid-20th century, the world's two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, locked horns not only on geopolitical fronts, but also in the expansive canvas of the cosmos. This period, known as the space race, was an intense rivalry fueled by technological might, scientific curiosity, and national pride. It was an era that embodied humanity's unyielding spirit to venture beyond the confines of our pale blue dot. The starting pistol for the space race was arguably fired on October 4, 1957, when the Soviet Union, under Nikita Khrushchev's leadership, stunned the world by successfully launching the first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1. The tiny beeping orb broadcasted not only radio signals, but also the Soviet Union's technological prowess, rattling the confidence of the US, who perceived themselves trailing in this celestial contest. The American response came in the form of Project Mercury, announced in 1958 under the administration of President Dwight D. Eisenhower. The Mercury 7, a group of carefully chosen astronauts, were to be America's answer to the Soviet challenge, ushering in a new era of American ingenuity. The US also formed the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, which would play a crucial role in the nation's journey to the stars. However, the Soviet Union had a card up its sleeve in the person of Yuri Gagarin. On April 12, 1961, he orbited the Earth in Vostok 1, earning him the title of the first human in space. This was another severe blow to American morale, prompting President John F. Kennedy to make a daring announcement. On May 25, 1961, in a bold speech to Congress, he declared, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The Apollo program, NASA's moon landing project, was thus thrust into high gear. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, Sergei Korolev, the chief designer of the Soviet space program, toiled away at the lunar program in the shadowy secrecy that marked much of the Soviet space endeavors. Tragically, Korolev's untimely demise in 1966 dealt a severe blow to the lunar program, further tilting the scales in favor of the Americans. While both nations' endeavors were characterized by incredible achievements, they also experienced heartbreaking setbacks. The Apollo 1 fire in 1967, claiming the lives of three astronauts during a ground test, was a grim reminder of the dangers associated with space exploration, yet both superpowers persevered each spurred by the other's successes and failures. By 1969, after a decade filled with nerve-wracking anticipation, the world watched with bated breath as Apollo 11's Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the lunar surface, marking a victory for the United States in this high-stakes race. 
Armstrong's famous words, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, seem to encapsulate not just the climax of the space race, but the shared aspiration of humanity as a whole. Unsung architects of the lunar triumph, the minds behind Apollo. In every monumental endeavor that mankind undertakes, there are invariably a few visionaries who become the guiding stars of the journey. The Apollo mission, the most audacious voyage humans ever embarked upon, was no different. A motley crew of scientists, engineers and politicians rallied together, their talents converging to carve a pathway to the moon. At the helm of this audacious undertaking stood President John F. Kennedy. His vision, encapsulated in his bold 1961 proclamation to Congress, set the lunar aspiration into motion. He declared, We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Kennedy's bold challenge gave wings to America's lunar dreams and cemented his place in the history of the space race. However, the soul of the Apollo mission resided not in the White House, but in the less heralded confines of NASA's research facilities. German-American engineer Werner von Braun was one of the pivotal figures at NASA. A gifted scientist and an imaginative pioneer, von Braun, previously involved with Germany's V-2 rocket program during the Second World War, was the mastermind behind the Saturn V rocket. This technological marvel, standing as tall as a 36-story building, was the powerhouse that propelled Apollo 11 to the moon. Von Braun's contribution was so significant that he was often playfully referred to as the man who sold the moon. Yet, this extraordinary voyage required more than political will and scientific genius. It required an army of dedicated engineers and workers who toiled away in anonymity. Among them was Katherine Johnson, an African-American mathematician whose calculations were instrumental in ensuring the safe trajectory for Apollo 11. Despite working in an era marked by racial and gender barriers, Johnson shattered the glass ceiling with her phenomenal contributions, earning the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015. Another less known but equally essential figure was Margaret Hamilton, the lead software engineer for Project Apollo. Her team was responsible for developing the onboard flight software for the Apollo missions. A memorable photograph from 1969 showcases Hamilton standing next to a stack of code she and her team wrote by hand for the mission, the stack nearly as tall as she was. The rigor of Hamilton's code was put to the test when, moments before Apollo 11's lunar landing, her software overrode a potential command error, saving the mission from possible failure. Behind the political figureheads and the brilliant minds working at NASA, the supporting cast of countless technicians engineers and administrative staff also deserve our admiration. They were the unseen hands that shaped the Apollo mission, working tirelessly around the clock, ensuring that every minor detail was accounted for. This constellation of people, from President Kennedy to the anonymous technicians, played their part in turning the lunar dream into reality. The Apollo mission was not just the triumph of a nation, it was the victory of these untold heroes who dared to reach for the stars. Their collective efforts not only transformed the course of history, but also reshaped our understanding of what is possible when humanity dares to dream beyond the confines of our home planet. Journey to the launch pad, the Herculean task of preparing Apollo 11. The conception of Apollo 11, while fueled by the fires of political ambition and scientific curiosity, was an endeavor that required an immense level of preparation. The unprecedented task of landing a man on the moon necessitated that each detail be attended to with meticulous precision, from the strenuous astronaut training to the ingenious spacecraft design. The heroes of this epic voyage were none other than Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, selected in January 1969 as the prime crew for the mission. Armstrong, the mission commander, was a veteran test pilot and had demonstrated his calm demeanor during the near-disastrous Gemini 8 mission. Aldrin, the lunar module pilot, brought his expertise in orbital mechanics to the team. Collins, piloting the command module, was tasked with the daunting responsibility of navigating the lonely path around the moon 
while his comrades descended to the lunar surface. The crew underwent intense training in a variety of simulations designed to replicate the harsh conditions they would face. Armstrong and Aldrin spent countless hours in a contraption called the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle, nicknamed the Flying Bedstead, learning to navigate the complex lunar module. Collins spent his days mastering the complex systems of the command module, ensuring he could return the crew safely home. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away in Florida, the colossal Saturn V rocket, the most potent symbol of America's lunar ambitions, was under construction. This behemoth, designed by Werner von Braun and his team, stood at a towering 363 feet and was built to carry the astronauts and their equipment more than 238,000 miles to the moon. The meticulous assembly of this technological marvel involved countless engineers and technicians working around the clock, checking and double-checking each bolt and wire to ensure the safety of the crew. One of the more unusual but vital parts of the preparation was the creation of the Lunar Module, affectionately named Eagle by the crew. The Lunar Module, unlike anything built before, was a two-stage vehicle specifically designed for the lunar environment. It had to be lightweight, yet sturdy enough to withstand the harsh lunar surface. This design challenge was met by the innovative minds at Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation, led by Tom Kelly, the father of the lunar module. The preparations for Apollo 11 were not without their tense moments. For instance, just weeks before the mission, there were concerns about the lunar module's weight. A potential solution suggested was to leave the lunar module's reflective insulation layer vital to maintaining temperature off the craft. After intense deliberation, it was determined that the layer would stay and other components were lightened instead. However, preparation for Apollo 11 was not solely about machines and men. It was about preparing the world for an event that would reshape our understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe. News of the mission disseminated across the globe, capturing the imagination of millions. Walter Cronkite, the veteran CBS news anchor, covered the event with palpable excitement, serving as the voice of Apollo to the eager public. Riding the giant, the unveiling of the Saturn V rocket. Imagine a mammoth machine, towering at 363 feet, weighing 6.2 million pounds, and packing the power of a small nuclear explosion. That was the Saturn V rocket, the mechanical titan that propelled Apollo 11 to the moon. Without this magnificent feat of engineering, the lunar landing might have remained a distant dream. The creation of the Saturn V, like the mission it was designed to support, was a blend of audacious ambition, scientific innovation, and an indomitable spirit of adventure. At the heart of the Saturn V's design was Werner von Braun, a gifted German-American scientist. His vision for the rocket was grounded in a design philosophy that espoused power and reliability. A testament to this principle was the rocket's F-1 engines, the most powerful single-chamber liquid-fueled rocket engine ever made. Five of these behemoths were mounted on the rocket's first stage, collectively producing 7.5 million pounds of thrust, enough to lift the entire structure off the Earth and set it on course to the Moon. The Saturn V was not just a paragon of raw power, but also a marvel of intricate design. It was a three-stage rocket. Each stage had a specific role in the mission and was discarded once its job was complete. The first stage, SIC, was responsible for the initial ascent, carrying the rocket about 42 miles up and reaching a speed of 6,164 miles per hour. The second stage, S-second, took over from there, pushing the rocket into the Earth's upper atmosphere. The third stage, S-4B had the critical task of placing the Apollo spacecraft into Earth's orbit and later propelling it towards the Moon. The manufacturing process of the Saturn V was an immense logistical challenge. It took place across multiple locations in the United States. The stages of the rocket were built in different parts of the country, from California to Louisiana, and then assembled at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. One of the famous anecdotes is that the rocket stages, due to their colossal size, couldn't be transported by road. Instead, they were carried on a barge, known as Palamon, via the Panama Canal across thousands of miles. 
The science behind the Saturn faith is a testament to human ingenuity. To overcome the colossal force of Earth's gravity, the rocket had to reach a speed, or escape velocity, of approximately 25,000 miles per hour. This involved burning vast quantities of fuel, a mix of kerosene and liquid oxygen, in a controlled yet potent explosion. The energy released was harnessed to propel the rocket upwards, a principle articulated by Sir Isaac Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Upon its first unmanned test launch on November 9, 1967, the Saturn V made its indelible mark on history. As the rocket roared to life, windows rattled miles away, and spectators watched in awe as the flaming behemoth ascended into the sky. NASA's Director of Launch Operations, Rocco Patron, described the scene saying, The shock wave rolled across the water, up the beach, up the pad's built-in flame deflector, and through the launch tower to the waiting spacecraft. It was a sound you felt, not heard. On the threshold, the dawn of July 16, 1969. The morning of July 16, 1969, dawned with the weight of history in the air. As the first light of the day broke over the Kennedy Space Center in Merritt Island, Florida, a sense of anticipation swept across the globe. For on this day, humanity stood on the cusp of a new era. An epoch-making journey was about to commence. Before the sun had risen, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins had already started their day with a traditional pre-flight breakfast of steak and eggs a customary ritual observed since the early Gemini missions. As they donned their spacesuits and made their way to the launch pad, millions of people across the globe held their breath. The astronauts, however, were calm and composed. Armstrong, ever the stoic commander, cracked a joke about how they would be flying on a rocket built by the lowest bidder, lightening the mood. At the launch site, the colossal Saturn V rocket stood poised against the morning sky a towering symbol of mankind's daring ambition. As the astronauts ascended the launch tower and entered the command module, aptly named Columbia, the countdown to the momentous journey had well and truly begun. From every corner of the United States, people gathered around their television sets. An estimated 530 million viewers worldwide sat glued to their screens, eager to witness the most audacious venture in human history. Crowds thronged the highways and beaches near the Kennedy Space Center, eyes glued to the magnificent spectacle unfolding before them. Walter Cronkite, CBS's trusted anchor, conveyed the nation's palpable excitement as he chronicled the launch live on national television. The atmosphere in Mission Control in Houston was a cocktail of intense focus and quiet tension. Flight Director Gene Kranz, an emblem of composed determination, led his team with a sense of solemn responsibility. He would later recount, On the day of the launch, there wasn't a lot of conversation. We all knew what was at stake. As the countdown clock hit zero, the Saturn V roared to life. In a crescendo of smoke and fire, the beastly rocket ascended into the sky. Those witnessing the launch described it as a sensory overload. The sight of the towering rocket taking off was paired with an earth-shattering roar that could be felt as a physical pressure wave. As Apollo 11 cut through the blue Florida sky, President Richard Nixon watched the launch from the White House. He later famously said, It is the greatest week in the history of the world since the creation. Such was the magnitude of the event, encapsulating the culmination of a decade's effort, encapsulating dreams nurtured since the dawn of civilization. Safely in space and on their way to the moon, the astronauts had a moment of reflection. Armstrong, speaking to Mission Control, uttered a phrase that resonated with millions around the world. This Saturn gave us a magnificent ride. It was very smooth. Everybody's very pleased up here. July 16, 1969, will forever be etched in the annals of human history. The day symbolizes our unyielding spirit of exploration and thirst for knowledge, epitomizing our ability to achieve the seemingly impossible when we dare to dream. That day, the human spirit took flight, soaring beyond the confines of our world and venturing into the final frontier. It was, as Armstrong would later describe it, one giant leap for mankind. From Earth to Moon, an odyssey through the cosmic seas. 
Once Apollo 11 broke free from Earth's gravitational grasp on July 16, 1969, the trio of brave astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, embarked on a historic four-day journey through the cosmic seas to our celestial neighbor, the Moon. This voyage, a mesmerizing dance of celestial mechanics, was an unprecedented quest that encapsulated the dreams of countless generations. The spacecraft hurtled through the void of space at a staggering 25,000 miles per hour. However, within the confines of the spacecraft, the astronauts experienced a tranquil environment. The sounds of rockets and roaring engines had given way to a profound silence, punctuated only by the hum of the spacecraft systems and the sporadic communications with mission control back on Earth. The daily routine for the astronauts was a far cry from an average day on Earth. Unburdened by the constraints of gravity, activities like eating, sleeping, and even moving required an adjustment. They ate specially designed meals, hydrated with water produced as a byproduct of the spacecraft's fuel cells, and even had to learn how to maneuver in the weightless environment. Nonetheless, they carried on with their tasks diligently, conducting experiments, checking equipment, and communicating their observations and status to the ever-watchful ears at Mission Control. A key moment during the journey was the execution of the translunar injection, a maneuver that placed Apollo 11 on a trajectory for the Moon. The mighty engines of the command and service module burned for approximately six minutes, propelling the spacecraft out of Earth orbit and onto a pathway to the Moon. Once en route, the astronauts performed a delicate dance of celestial choreography, the first ever docking maneuver in lunar mission history. The CSM Columbia separated from the last stage of the Saturn V, rotated in place and redocked with the lunar module Eagle, extracting it from its protective housing. This maneuver, although rehearsed countless times on Earth, was a critical part of the mission, and its successful execution was a testament to the crew's skill and training. During the voyage, the astronauts also had the opportunity to become astronomers. Armstrong and Aldrin, destined to descend to the lunar surface, studied the Moon's landscape while Collins, the designated command module pilot, analyzed lunar landmarks and navigated the course. They also had a unique view of our own planet, a blue marble suspended in the vast darkness of space, a sight that instilled in them a deep sense of awe and appreciation for our home. On the evening of July 19th, after 76 hours of travel, Apollo 11 entered lunar orbit. The spacecraft made several orbits around the Moon, and the astronauts busied themselves with final checks and preparations for the upcoming lunar descent. Collins, from his unique vantage point in the CSM, described the lunar surface as a vast, lonely, forbidding expanse of nothing. As Armstrong relayed back to mission control, the view of the Moon that we've been having recently is really spectacular. It fills about three quarters of the hatch window, and of course we can see the entire circumference, even though part of it is in complete shadow and part of it is in Earthshine. It's a view worth the price of the trip. The Lunar Waltz, dancing with destiny on the Moon's dusty stage. The Great Celestial Ballet reached its crescendo on July 20th, 1969. As millions held their breath on Earth, Two men, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, aboard the lunar module Eagle, commenced their descent towards the Moon, a maneuver famously known as the Powered Descent Initiation. In Houston, the flight director, Gene Kranz, gave the go-ahead, his voice cutting through the tension in the mission control room, you are go for powered descent. These words set in motion a sequence of events that marked the final steps of a journey that had started with the firing of the mighty Saturn V engines back on Earth. At the helm of the Eagle, Armstrong guided the lunar module, relying on years of rigorous training and instinct. The Eagle had only so much fuel to make the landing, and every second counted. The descent was fraught with unforeseen obstacles, not least of which were a series of computer alarms, denoting the lunar module's onboard computer was overloading with tasks. Back on Earth, a young computer engineer, Jack Garman, recognized the error code, a testament to his diligent preparation. He swiftly reassured Kranz that the mission could continue. We'll go on that alarm. The tension eased slightly, 
but the most challenging part of the descent was yet to come. As the eagle neared the surface, Armstrong noticed that their intended landing site was strewn with boulders, a potential disaster for the lunar module. Displaying exceptional skill and composure, he overrode the autopilot and manually steered the Eagle to a safer location, later named Tranquility Base. With less than 30 seconds of fuel remaining, the tension on Earth and in the spacecraft was palpable. But then came the words that marked a triumphant finale to an arduous descent. Armstrong's voice, a mixture of relief and elation, crackled over the radio. Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. For a moment, there was stunned silence, both at Mission Control and worldwide. Charlie Duke, the Capcom in Mission Control, responded, his voice choked with emotion. Roger, Twan, Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. As the dust settled around the lunar module, a profound sense of achievement enveloped Armstrong and Aldrin. They had journeyed through the dark sea of space and had safely arrived at an alien world, guided by their courage and a shared dream that stretched back to the dawn of humanity. During the ensuing hours, Armstrong and Aldrin prepared for their upcoming moonwalk while Collins orbited above in the command module Columbia. A poignant moment was when Aldrin took a moment for quiet reflection. The astronaut, who was an elder at the Webster Presbyterian Church, had brought with him a small chalice and sacramental bread and wine. Aldrin radioed, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask every person listening in, whoever and wherever they may be, to pause for a moment and contemplate the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his or her own way. As Aldrin partook in communion, he experienced a moment of spiritual solitude on the lunar surface, juxtaposed against the technical marvel of their lunar landing. Moonlight Sonata, the first steps and science amid lunar shadows. In the early hours of July 21st, 1969, on a seemingly desolate lunar landscape, humanity was about to create history, defying the constraints of our home planet. Neil Armstrong, the mission commander, cautiously descended the lunar module's ladder, paused for a moment at the footpad, then finally took that famous first step onto the lunar surface, proclaiming, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. With Armstrong's words echoing across the planet, the world watched as the astronaut's boot met the surface of the moon, churning up fine lunar soil, revealing a universe of undiscovered stories in each minuscule grain. An ocean away in living rooms across Earth, hearts skipped beats and eyes welled up. Buzz Aldrin joined Armstrong about 20 minutes later, describing the vista as magnificent desolation. The pair planted the American flag in the lunar soil, an iconic image captured for posterity. The flag was uniquely designed with an extended top horizontal bar so it would appear to fly in the moon's airless environment. However, their mission was more than symbolic gestures. Their lunar excursion was punctuated by a flurry of scientific activities. Armstrong and Aldrin deployed the early Apollo scientific experiments package composed of instruments to study the lunar environment. One key instrument was the passive seismic experiment package, designed to detect moonquakes and provide information about the lunar interior. Another was the laser-ranging retroreflector, an array of mirrored prisms, still used today to measure the precise distance between the Earth and Moon by bouncing lasers off them. Remarkably, these are the only Apollo experiments still in operation, silent witnesses to our first lunar explorations. The astronauts also collected a total of 47.5 pounds of lunar material, ranging from dust to larger rock samples. The most famous sample was the Genesis rock, a piece of the Moon's primordial crust over four billion years old, a tangible testament to the early history of our solar system. Armstrong and Aldrin also performed the Lunar Field Geology Experiment, documenting their observations of the lunar surface. Their first-hand descriptions of the moon's geology added valuable context to the hard data collected by the instruments. There's a lesser-known anecdote that reveals the human side of this scientific endeavor. Tucked away in Armstrong's spacesuit pocket was a tiny silicon disk, roughly the size of a 50-cent piece. 
The disc carried goodwill messages from 73 countries, microscopically etched onto its surface. The silicon disc, as it came to be known, was left on the moon's surface, a testament to the unity that the lunar landing symbolized. The moonwalk lasted a mere 2.5 hours, but its impact was timeless. The audacity of Armstrong and Aldrin's lunar ballet, coupled with their scientific contributions, changed the way we perceived our place in the cosmos. The lunar surface, once a distant celestial object of fascination, became a touchstone of human achievement and curiosity. The Homeward Dance, a voyage from lunar desolation to ocean embrace. Having accomplished an unprecedented feat of setting foot on an alien world, the astronauts of Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, left behind the barren tranquility of the moon on July 21, 1969. Their lunar module, aptly named Eagle, soared from the moon, guided by the invisible threads of gravity and physics, and aimed for a speck of refuge in the void, the orbiting command module, Columbia, piloted by Michael Collins. As they approached, Collins, the oft-forgotten yet indispensable third member of the Apollo 11 crew, was ready to perform one of the mission's most perilous tasks. He had to reconnect Columbia with the Eagle in a delicate high-speed ballet, 69 miles above the moon's surface. He later shared, I was the anxious host awaiting the arrival of guests. A single miscalculation could have disastrous consequences, leaving Armstrong and Aldrin stranded. Thankfully, the docking went smoothly. Eagle and Columbia united in a triumphant embrace, a reunion of men and machines in the desolate beauty of lunar orbit. Following this rendezvous, the Eagle, its historic role completed, was released, left to wander eternally around the moon. The trip back to Earth was a journey of anticipation and apprehension. On July 24th, after a three-day voyage across the silent chasm of space, Apollo 11's command module re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Hurtling through the sky at nearly 25,000 miles per hour, Columbia was enveloped in a sheath of glowing plasma, momentarily cutting off communication with mission control. This terrifying radio blackout lasted longer than predicted, adding a final dose of drama to an already nerve-wracking mission. Finally, the parachutes were deployed, their blooming canopies a welcome sight to the observers on the recovery ship, USS Hornet, waiting in the Pacific Ocean. With a splashdown about 812 nautical miles southwest of Hawaii, Columbia completed its incredible journey, its precious cargo safe and sound. The world collectively exhaled. As Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins bobbed in the ocean, waiting for retrieval, they engaged in a peculiar tradition. They opened a small pouch labelled Post Splashdown Command Module Biocontrol and placed on a pair of biological isolation garments as a precaution against any potential moon germs. The quarantine measures even extended to a curious ritual known as the Big Sneeze, where the astronauts were sprayed with a disinfectant and the command module wiped clean before their official welcome back to Earth. President Richard Nixon, aboard the USS Hornet, eagerly waited to welcome the returning heroes. But the astronauts would have to wait a bit longer for a proper reunion with their families and friends. They were whisked away to a mobile quarantine facility, a converted Airstream trailer, to begin a 21-day period of isolation. Inside this unusual abode, the astronauts were visited by President Nixon. He congratulated them, saying, Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world, and as you talk to us from the sea of tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. Upon a star-studded stage, the worldwide ovation for Earth's lunar pioneers. Following their momentous journey to the moon and back, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins became more than mere astronauts. They became embodiments of human ambition, symbols of our limitless potential. Their first public appearance post-quarantine was a grand ticker tape parade in New York City on August 13th, aptly named the Giant Leap Parade. In their open-top car, they weaved through the confetti-dusted streets, flanked by marching bands, beneath skyscrapers draped with banners of congratulatory messages. 
The fervor was echoed in Chicago later the same day, where an estimated two million people cheered for their lunar heroes. On August 14th, the astronauts, along with their wives, were invited to a formal state dinner at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles, the first ever presidential dinner held outside the White House. In attendance were an illustrious array of guests, movie stars, politicians, industrialists, and even former astronauts. President Richard Nixon, paying homage to their achievement, lauded them as the pioneers of the future. His words captured the essence of the evening. However, the celebrations were far from over. The following day marked the beginning of their 45-day Giant Step Apollo 11 presidential goodwill tour, during which they visited 25 countries and 31 cities. Their journey, in a specially modified Boeing 707 dubbed Air Force One Half, was as much about international diplomacy as it was about celebrating the achievement of Apollo 11. Everywhere they went, from Mexico City to Kinshasa, from Madrid to Bangkok, they were received with overwhelming joy and admiration. In London, they were paraded through Piccadilly Circus, cheered on by an ecstatic crowd of over a million. In Yugoslavia, a young boy handed Armstrong a letter that read, You were courageous and brave, and you have shown us that man is capable of everything. On this worldwide tour, they were not just representing NASA or America, but humanity as a whole. In each meeting with world leaders, Armstrong echoed a sentiment he'd shared on the moon. We came in peace for all mankind. Whether they were visiting the Shah of Iran, Pope Paul VI, or the Queen of England, they carried with them a message of unity and shared accomplishment. One particularly poignant stop was their visit to the United Nations on September 16th. Addressing the General Assembly, Armstrong reflected, we were further away than any people in the history of the world, and yet we were very close, close in the sense of being a part of all mankind. Their journey concluded on November 5, 1969, back in Washington, D.C., where they received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor. It was a fitting end to their whirlwind tour, a period where, for a brief moment, three men who journeyed to the moon brought the world a little closer together. Lunar Echoes, Revelations from the Moon's Silent Witness Within the cavernous halls of the Lunar Receiving Laboratory at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, a new chapter of discovery was set in motion. Apollo 11 had delivered its celestial bounty, 47.5 pounds of lunar samples, a quiet testament to a four, five billion year old narrative waiting to be deciphered. Immediately following the astronauts' release from quarantine on August 10, 1969, the precious cargo was opened. This collection of dust, rock and pebbles, the first extraterrestrial materials returned by humans, ignited a surge of anticipation within the scientific community. The extensive analysis that followed would illuminate our understanding of the Moon and the solar system in ways previously undreamed of. Some samples bore witness to a tumultuous past, the scars of immense meteoric impacts, and the geologic upheaval known as the Late Heavy Bombardment, approximately four billion years ago. These testimonies helped scientists to comprehend the early violent chapters of the solar system. Unveiling another mystery, the lunar materials carried evidence of a surprising similarity between Earth and the Moon's isotopic compositions. This affinity supported a theory that suggested a dramatic birth for our lunar companion. According to the giant impact hypothesis, a Mars-sized body named Theia collided with a nascent Earth, causing a fragment of our planet to be hurtled into space, eventually forming the Moon. A captivating discovery was the presence of tiny glassy spheres, formed from lunar soil melted by the intense heat of meteor impacts. These spheres, rich in volatile elements like zinc, contradicted the prevailing belief that the Moon was extremely dry. It suggested that the lunar interior might hold more water than previously assumed. This finding, unveiled decades later in 2008, offered tantalizing prospects for future lunar missions and potential habitation. One of the more intriguing samples was a rock, later dubbed Genesis Rock. Retrieved by Apollo 15 astronauts, 
This fragment of anorthosite was believed to be a piece of the moon's primordial crust. Despite its earthly age of only a few decades, the rock's lunar age was estimated at over four billion years. It was a mute spectator to the early history of the moon, offering unprecedented insights into our celestial neighbor's infancy. Beyond scientific revelations, the moon rocks held cultural significance too. Tiny fragments from Apollo 11 and Apollo 17 were distributed worldwide, encapsulated in acrylic and mounted on plaques as goodwill gifts from the United States. Known as the Apollo Moon Rocks, they stand in museums and institutions around the world as silent ambassadors of a monumental human achievement. The Moon Rocks spurred an incredible scientific renaissance that continues to this day. As recently as 2021, NASA launched the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis Program, intended to study unopened samples using more advanced technology, offering new perspectives on old discoveries. Lunar Illusions, the tangles of moon landing skepticism. With the achievement as colossal as the Apollo 11 mission, it is no surprise that some saw the shadows of doubt where there were only footprints of achievement. Almost as quickly as humanity took its giant leap, whispers of denial started floating, evolving into the persistent and fascinating world of moon landing skepticism. The denial movement, often painted with the broad strokes of the conspiracy theory brush, has many facets. From the innocently curious to the stubbornly unconvinced, these skeptics have taken the trust but verify adage to heart, casting doubt on what is arguably one of humanity's greatest feats. Among the most enduring of these theories is the notion that the moon landing was an elaborate hoax orchestrated by the American government, keen to claim Cold War victory. Staged in a secret location, often speculated as Area 51, skeptics argue that the event broadcasted to millions was merely a movie directed by the likes of Stanley Kubrick, a claim he humorously refuted. The proof skeptics offer varies, but one of the most repeated is the supposed irregularities in the photographs taken on the moon. They question why shadows appear to fall in different directions, indicating multiple light sources, a situation impossible on the moon. Scientists have countered this, explaining the phenomena as a result of the moon's uneven terrain and the wide-angle lens of the camera, causing distortion. The absence of stars in the lunar photos also raises eyebrows. However, the explanation is rather simple. The brightness of the moon's surface, coupled with the camera settings designed to capture this brightness, resulted in the stars being too dim to appear. Others find the flag's behavior suspicious, fluttering as if caught in a breeze, a seeming impossibility in the vacuum of space. However, the flag had a horizontal rod to hold it extended, and any movement was due to the astronauts manipulating it into place. The origins of these conspiracy theories are as varied as the theories themselves. For some, it's an expression of deep-seated distrust in government establishments. Others are drawn to the romantic idea of peeking behind the curtain of accepted reality. Sociologist Ted Goetzel suggested that conspiracy theories often attract people who had anomia, a feeling of being disconnected from society and a distrust of global institutions. While it's easy to dismiss these skeptics as fringe outliers, it's essential to recognize that these theories, however outlandish, underscore an important aspect of human nature, our relentless quest for understanding. They represent a skepticism that, when applied positively, can lead to breakthroughs and paradigm shifts. It's the same curiosity that drove us to the moon in the first place. Ironically, the same technology that allowed us to go to the moon also allows for the perpetuation of these myths. However, as we gear up for a new era of lunar exploration, with Artemis missions promising a return to the moon, these theories will have to face a new wave of lunar truths. So, while there's a certain allure to moon landing myths, perhaps astronaut Alan Shepard, commander of Apollo 14, summed it up best. When confronted by a skeptic, he simply replied, OK, you have your beliefs, and I have mine. I went to the moon. Echoes of Apollo, the resounding impact of a lunar legacy. When Apollo 11 pierced the lunar sky on July 20th, 1969, it was more than just a physical journey. It was a voyage that transcended boundaries, cultures, and generations. 
leaving an indelible impression not just on the moon's dusty surface, but also on our global consciousness. In the realm of space exploration, Apollo 11's triumphant lunar landing gave rise to a new era of ambition and discovery. The success of the mission fueled further expeditions, including six more successful Apollo lunar landings. In 1971, Alan Shepard, during the Apollo 14 mission, famously hit two golf balls on the lunar surface, signifying humanity's ability to perform common earthly activities in an extraterrestrial environment. These pioneering endeavors opened up the lunar surface as a field for scientific exploration, and decades later, even potential colonization. Notably, the advances of the Apollo program served as a catalyst for numerous technological breakthroughs. For instance, the miniaturization of electronics, a necessity for the space-bound Apollo guidance computer, directly paved the way for the development of the microchip. This innovation has influenced nearly every facet of modern life, from personal computing to advanced medical equipment. The digital cameras that we so ubiquitously use today owe their existence to technology developed for space exploration during the Apollo era. Charge-coupled devices, which capture images in digital cameras, were originally designed to improve the imaging capabilities of telescopes. Similarly, the space blankets that are a common sight in survival kits were first developed by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center for use in the Apollo missions. However, the impact of Apollo 11 wasn't limited to technical advancements. The mission also had far-reaching effects on global geopolitics. In the heat of the Cold War, the successful lunar landing was a peaceful demonstration of the United States' technological prowess, marking a significant turning point. The moon race may have started as a competition, but it ended in cooperation. In 1975, the Apollo-Soyuz test project saw an American Apollo module dock with a Soviet Soyuz craft, marking the end of the space race and the beginning of an era of international space collaboration that continues today. Culturally, the Apollo 11 mission sparked an upsurge in science and astronomy interest. The iconic images of Earth as seen from the Moon, including the famous Earthrise photo, awakened a new ecological consciousness, accelerating the environmental movement. The mission even left a deep imprint on the creative world. It inspired a plethora of films, books, songs and artwork, highlighting our enduring fascination with the Moon and the cosmos. Yet perhaps the most profound impact of Apollo 11 is the way it expanded the horizons of the human spirit. As Neil Armstrong stepped onto the lunar surface and spoke his immortal words, he encapsulated the daring spirit of exploration that is intrinsic to human nature. This mission reminded us of what we can achieve when we dare to dream big and work collectively towards a shared goal. In the wise words of Arthur C. Clarke, the renowned futurist and science fiction author, the Apollo flights will be remembered when the pyramids have crumbled to sand. Indeed, the legacy of Apollo 11 continues to echo in our advancements, our ambitions, and our collective memory, reminding us that the moon is not our final frontier, but a stepping stone into the vast, unexplored cosmos. As the lunar dust settled from the momentous Apollo 11 mission, an echo of Neil Armstrong's footprints was left behind, a testament to human will and ingenuity. The date, July 20th, 1969, forever etched into history, marked not an end, but the opening of a grand cosmic door. The names of Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins are now intertwined with our celestial neighbor, illuminating our sense of wonder each time we gaze at the moon. As we drift back from this celestial voyage, it's fitting to reflect on the profound words of Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot of Apollo 11 himself. In the aftermath of this grand endeavor, he poignantly remarked, we came in peace for all mankind. Every look at the night sky is a reminder of our potential, a tribute to a time when we reached out and touched another world. We stood on the moon, a celestial body that had graced our night sky for millennia, our collective ambition embodied in the Apollo 11 mission. Our lunar quest may have started with Apollo 11, but rest assured, the journey continues ever onwards to the stars and beyond.